Bingo, one o'clock rock. I'm so happy to be here with Henrietta Dulai. Welcome to the show, Henrietta. Thank you. Glad to call be you here. Doctor Henrietta. Oh, the Henrietta is fine. <laughs> So uh, Henrietta is a very special person, first because she has the same first name that my grandmother had that makes a special, you know, ab initio, that's important. But the other is that she's an associate professor at the Department of Geology and Geophysics at SOWEST, the School of Ocean and Earth Science at UH Manoa. And she's studying and working in radioisotopes and coastal hydrology. That's why we're calling this show <clears throat> Fukushima Fingerprints coming to Hawaii. You'll see what I mean in a minute. So tell us what you do, Henrietta. So I, because of my education, I learned to use radioactive elements to study earth processes. Specifically, I focus about water, the water cycle, how it flows from the land to the ocean, what happens to different chemicals then within the ocean, what can we learn about ocean currents, and how the chemicals coming from the land to the ocean, by water flow, support biology and other processes in That's the ocean. That's it? In a nutshell. <laughs> but me, then, it, then it goes to much wider. Henrietta yes. Dulai is a geochemist who uses chemical tracers, that's always exciting, to study coastal hydrology and biogeochemistry. I never heard that one before. Uh, in this episode, we hear about her use of radiochemistry. I never heard that one either to investigate the dispersion of Fukushima-derived radioisotopes in the Pacific. That's really exciting. You're in the top 1% of exciting scientists. <laughs> wow, exciting. So what is with all of these radio things and radioactive, I guess that means? What are you working on in terms of Fukushima? Right, so I alluded to the hydrology part, and as, as you just said, that's my everyday, what keeps me busy and is fun, that I use natural radioactivity to learn about processes. But then when Fukushima happened, I thought, okay, this is something we have to follow up on, and how can we use all the radionuclides, not just to learn how bad or what are the levels of radioactivity from Fukushima that came to us, but also to learn about ocean currents or... or or precipitation patterns and, and other information that, that um, these radionuclides help us learn about. So it can, what you're learning about the, the processes by which these things, these radioactive elements are carried around the Pacific. Correct. You know, so uh, before the show, I was telling you, I'm so impressed with So West and UH Manoa. We know so much about the Pacific. We know everything, well, everything there is to know <laughs> about the Pacific, and you're just one of that one of the parts of that at, at SOWEST. Uh, we know the weather, we know the water, we know the air, uh, we know the biochemistry of the ocean, uh, we know, you know, the bottom of the ocean, the top of the ocean. I mean, you could, uh, even on this show, sitting in that chair, we have learned so much about what goes on in the Pacific Ocean. There's a lot to learn, but UH Manoa is really on top of it. I'm, I'm so impressed with that. You, you ought to know this. You ought to know. You ought to be, you know, you ought to admire Henrietta and all her colleagues that study the Pacific Ocean know so much about it. So, okay, so we're going to find out what happened to all that radioactive debris that, that was drifting off Fukushima. What's the path it takes? So let me stop right there to tease that question apart. Yes, there was a tsunami that released the debris, and that debris started moving offshore with the currents taking them and diluting the patch. But it, it traveled along. The garbage patch, uh, referred to affectionately so by the scientific community as the garbage patch. Yes. And um, the Fukushima power plant disaster happened a few days after the tsunami. So the leakage of the radionuclide started on the 12th, 13th, and 14th of March. So the patch or the, the, the plume moved a little bit offshore already when most of the deposition happened. So the, the debris itself did not carry much radioactivity on it, only what fell on it. So it wasn't soaking in, in the discharged waters much. Okay, okay. So we have tested different items that were caught that were uh, um, shown to originate from Japan, never found any significant levels of, of Fukushima-derived radioactivity on them. So the, the plume itself, the debris, was uh, not... What is a plume? Uh, I defined a plume <laughs> <laughs> as um, a consolidated 
uh, or, or, or organized uh, patch that, that travels with the current. Okay. And, and before we get too much further off that, why does the plume stay together? What are the, the physical processes that keep it in a, in, together in a plume? So processes in the ocean that are not just major big currents that, that move the plume, but then little, little, uh, smaller eddies that, that cause smaller scale mixing would disperse um, the, the, the debris. So that would make it dissipate, eventually mix. Eventually it will um, be dissipated. It's not going to stay together forever. Well, eventually it will re reach the North Pacific garbage patch. Which is the biggest. Uh, which is within the, the gyre. The gyre. That's yes. the gyre and that's located northeast of Hawaii and in the lee of Alaska there in the Pacific Northwest, right? Yes. Somewhere in there. Correct, yes. Uh, they probably don't like having it around. No one does like no to have no garbage in their backyard, yeah, correct. Yeah. How far offshore is it, you know, say from Alaska or the Pacific Northwest? So we are talking about thousands of miles, but it shifts. And so all the debris that our north shore of the islands get, is some of it is coming from that. And, and the, the gyre, it, it, it implies that it's moving in some kind of circle, some kind yes. of whirlpool effect? Yes, that is. That, that's the way the Pacific works in that area. Yes. And it, and it gathers the, the patch. Yes. Yeah. And so these currents, the same currents, were the ones that carried the Fukushima-derived radionuclides, all the ones that get released from the power plants and deposited from the atmosphere. So these currents would then carry um, the radionuclides that were dissolved, so not as particles or, or something hard to but touch, in the it's dissolved. So the currents would carry these radionuclides across the Pacific. So they're just in the water, dissolved, dissolved, dissolved in the like water. Dissolved, like a salt. When you like put salt. salt in the water, the potassium, the sodium, they all dissolve and, and, and that flow with the currents. But you, can, you can sponsor them, I mean, you can, you can see them, uh, you can spot them. Uh, with uh, instruments, you can s spot them with um, radioactive sensitive radio sensors or something, right? That's the, the choice that, that scientists use. So physical oceanographers, for example, try to understand the currents based on their temperature and salinity. Um, what we did is there is no sensor that could look down the earth and say where it's more radioactive than other places. Oh. Not even an airplane that could fly was, would be able to detect such low concentrations as we are talking about. Low concentrations. So we had to actually collect thousands and thousands of liters, or gallons if you prefer, of water and individually analyze samples, concentrating all that radioactivity into a tiny volume which then was, was measured with the How instruments. How do you do that? So you, you take a, a, a bottle and you scoop up the water and now you have thousands of bottles of water in a, a given place. Yes. How do you concentrate it? So we um, specifically we focused on cesium isotopes. Those were released from Fukushima and the largest quantities that would directly uh, affect the environment. And so um, it's also easier to measure and behaves differently than iodine, which was also released. So cesium would deposit um, with wet deposition from the atmosphere and also was released by, by water masses. And so we would go to places where we wanted to see whether that cesium plume is there or not. We would take a 100 liter sample. A 100 liters, filter it through this tiny column of uh, little beads organic beads, so organic material, that, that can preferentially capture cesium out of the water. So as the water flows through these beads, the beads collect the cesium, the rest of the water and other ions uh, simply pass through. And then we have the beads that are concentrated, um, that concentrated out all the cesium from the water. That's, uh, that's radioactive. And, and so cesium, there were two cesium isotopes released from Fukushima. One has a 30 year half-life, so we'll be around with us for another 100 years or so. Mm. And the other has a two-year half-life, cesium-134, which decays. Um, so within so five half-lives. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're done five uh, years not ago. Yet. It, yeah. Not yet. So it's been only two and a half half-lives. So yeah. it's, it takes about five half-lives. So oh, I see. 10, I see. Ten two, years to really go. for it to go. So, but um, and if you went, say, to the Atlantic Ocean, but they didn't have Fukushima, and you started making the same collection, you'd probably be able to find some cesium there too. Oh, definitely. You? Yeah. So the cesium story in the ocean started in the 50s um, when we were testing 
nuclear weapons uh, above ground, uh, blowing up atolls uh, and so like forth. Bikini Island. Ooh. Exactly. So Ooh. there is yes a big big environmental problem yes. that was not uh, planned. There's, there's a book by Simon Winchester from the East West Center called Pacific, just the word Pacific. And the first chapter in this book is the detailed discussion of what happened at Bikini. Mm. It will make you sick to read this, make anybody sick. Right. Pacific by Simon Winchester, it's worth getting okay. it. Amazon, yeah, sorry. Um, right, so a lot of cesium was released already in the late 50s and early 60s, and that cesium is still around with us. And so back then, um, huge amounts of cesium were dispersed. The same kind that was released from Fukushima, but because of the differences in half-life, the short one has be been gone, right? So within 10 years or so. The other one is still around, and we can detect it all around the world, not just in the ocean, but on land also. And all this from the cesium at Fukushima? No, no, no. I'm talking about the nuclear weapons. Oh, talking about bikini. Still, oh, so it's dispersed still the nuclear from weapons. there. And that's what, how many years ago? 60, 70, yes. 60 years ago. Yes, and then Chernobyl added a little bit to that, but other sources also, man-made sources, reprocessing plants released some of the cesium into like Salafield, into the so, Irish so, Sea. So do, I care, do I care about cesium? For example, if the waiter comes and he says, how would you like your martini? And I would say, uh, you know, With put cesium? a little cesium in there. Uh, would I want cesium in my martini? Uh, probably there is some already in there. <laughs> oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's the point here that I uh, the message I would like to take to to get across that yes we are uh, aware that radioactivity is harmful yet we have been living with it all around us forever because there are these natural radionuclides that probably have higher levels of of radioactivity than than the cesium and I don't mean to say that it's okay to have cesium in the environment I'm just saying that. We have been living with radioactivity all along. Our bodies, for example, have, um, let's say, use an example of potassium, natural potassium, about 140 grams or so. And I looked this up. I have not measured that, but this is an accepted literature value. Our body has about 140 grams of potassium, out of which some of it is radioactive, and it's natural. And that radioactive part gives us an inventory of 5,000 Becquerels of potassium 40. Uh, becquerels, potassium 40 is radioactive. Yes. So becquerels are the unit that we use for radioactivity. That means how many decays we see per, per second from a certain amount. So our body has this natural radioactivity. So if you add a few atoms of cesium to it, I'm not saying it doesn't do an added effect, but it's it doesn't you help. see my point. It doesn't yeah. help. It doesn't help. Yeah. But if you add one or two to the 5,000, it's you, you don't know it's, what the it's combination of the cocktail effect, yeah? Yeah. I, that's, that's why I was talking about martinis. <laughs> We're going to have one now. It'll be really right. quick. It'll be a one-minute uh, you know, martini break. We'll be right back. You'll see. Henrietta Dulai. We'll be right Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kawilucas.com, and also on ThinkTech's show. Sorry. Okay, with uh, Ethan Allen on Friday, we talked about uh, the biome. We talked about how you know bacteria is a, a working part, a symbiotic part of our our life, our life and our bodies, and how our bodies are really the, the descendants of bacteria uh, in some way, many, many, many years ago. Um, but you know, all of this is so is so is so 
so special, really. Well, the cells hang together and we get to be human beings and do what we do. Um, but it's more complicated than just a human being, sterile and isolated from the, the environment. We are, we are part of the environment. The environment is part of us. And if we have these uh, radioactive elements in our body, that doesn't really help because it changes the atomic chemistry. Is that a word you ever heard before? The atomic... Structure? Structure, thank you. <laughs> atomic structure of our bodies and therefore, you know, messes up our cells and maybe gives us cancer. What? That's the fear from radioactivity, yes, that, that it causes disruption in, in the chemical bonds that then causes genetic mutations, leads to cancers. And I mentioned potassium-40 specifically because it's already in our bodies. It has been there forever. We don't know whether our bodies really, I mean, our bodies are really um, accustomed to My that wife much. My has a store of bananas at all times. Oh, exactly. She I will get back wants to bananas. Potassium. Yes? Isn't potassium good for you? Uh, you have been eating it for a while and it's, <laughs> You know, you're fine with it, of course, yes. Um, so back to being serious. So uh, this potassium-40, our body is accustomed to. Yeah. And so there has always been some natural radioactivity in us. There has always been some basic level of disruption in the, in the molecules. And so that's what the radioactive nuclides cause, that they, yeah. they, they cut simply through. And our body has the ability to repair itself. So really, some people, from this kind of damage from yes. radioactivity. And so if you get a lower dose, if one gets a lower dose, our body is able to remediate that. It's once we get a very high dose, that's when can't the body can't recover and can be a serious acute radiation dose causing immediate effects or then the latent, latent effects that appear uh, Decades many, many later. years yeah, later. Yeah. And that's, that's the very specifically with Fukushima, for example. Those people that got acute, uh, chroni uh, acute um, so chronic doses were the workers in the power plant. Yes. But the population that was displaced and evacuated, for them it's more the latent effect by consuming the food, e breathing the air um, there and yeah. drinking the water that might be tainted with Fukushima derived radionuclides. Yeah. And, and they're not really protecting themselves either. The, the workers arguably knew there was a risk and they could protect themselves with all those suits and breathing apparatus and whatnot. But the people in the neighborhood, they, they didn't, weren't able to protect themselves. In the same right, way. and there were several um, uh, evacuation levels. Yeah. And so not all the people were moved out at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you're out there in the ocean trying yes. to track on these radioactive materials and you're getting water Liters at a, many liters at a time, yes. and you're putting it through, through these strainers to strain out cesium, and now you can have, a, a, I guess, a concentrated sample of the cesium that's out there. What does this do for you? So specifically, you wear gloves when you do this, right? Um, yes, <laughs> because I, of other chemicals are involved in that, oh, not okay, specifically okay. for the cesium. Actually, gloves do not protect you against gamma radiation necessarily. What do you do? Gamma radiation travels through gloves. And the levels we measure are not uh, not that high, okay. so, so we don't. So have you don't to worry too much about no. it. I notice you're not glowing in any way. No, I'm yeah, let the record not to reflect. <laughs> Henry is not glowing. <laughs> well, I mean, you might be glowing, but it's not that kind of a glow. Thank <laughs> as long you. as you're having fun. <laughs> right, right. So, so anyway, so that kind of um, uh, sampling allowed us to trace the initial direction uh, where the the plume that was released from all the cooling ponds and other places within the reactor or just the cooling water that they sprayed on the reactor and then discharged to the ocean. Where did that travel and how fast? So there were models that were produced within a reasonable amount of time after the accident predicting where the radionuclides would travel. And some predicted that would it go direct hit towards Hawaii and Alaska and the US West Coast. And so obviously we were concerned, but no model is perfect. It just depends on what data you feed into it, right? Yeah. So, so still wanted to check. And we had a cruise organized in June of 2011, um, during which we produced a, a, a set of data kind of along the line between Japan and Hawaii. And right away there, we saw the higher elevations of the cesium uh, near Japan, which then uh, got much lower and apparently didn't even reach the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, in fortunately, 2011. in 2011. So it, it 
was steered more towards the north with the Kuroshio current and the North Pacific okay, so current. So that we turn left as it got closer to the island. Yes. Turn north to go north. into the, the, the gyre. Yes. Okay. And so uh, there are some models that then predicted that, okay, so we understand it went to the north. Let's see how it will disperse then farther. When will Hawaii and the other places around the Pacific see it? And it was one model predicted that we would see the radiation in 2014. So we said, oh, well, doing this transect, we cannot stop sampling. So we have been sampling in 2011 and 2012 every month even from Station Aloha, an offshore station, mm. and then the coastlines of Carr's Hawaii. Place, exactly, he we was collecting, well. yes, mm. and he was col his team was collecting samples yeah. for us. Yeah. And um, so we have been monitoring regularly and then realizing that, okay, the plume does not directly hit Hawaii. So we scaled it down, now we are sampling every six months. And I can tell that up to this date, we have not seen Fukushima derived cesium 134 at detectable levels in the near vicinity of Hawaiian Islands. How close? Uh, Station Aloha is 100 miles. So it's, um, not, it's not within 100 it's miles. It's not definitely not within 100 so miles. You have to go out and do this on a systematic basis uh, with time intervals, using the same gathering system each time. Yes. And then you go to a location and see what's there. And then you make a mark on the chart somehow and say what you found. And then after a while, you get to map all these things out. You can track the plume as it goes across the Pacific. So right now, we have not had a major, you know, arrival of this this uh, cesium one thirty four. We, in not, Hawaii. So is it mean it bypassed us and we don't have to worry it anymore? It went north of us, but the ocean still mixes and the cesium will disperse. So yeah. the cruise that I mentioned was organized in collaboration with the Woods Oceanographic Institution and some That's other organizations. Yes. What do they know about the Pacific? They're on the Atlantic Ocean right there. Oh, they are close collaborators, <laughs> not just with us, but okay. the other teams in Hawaii. So I wouldn't discount them. So yeah. you learning more from them or are they learning more from it's you? It's a collaboration. <laughs> okay. and, and I brought this up because it's still a collaboration simply one cruise cannot answer all the questions we have. So it's many different cruises, many different groups yeah. putting the data together. Yeah. And actually, I mentioned the Woods Hole Group because they have this database um, that has most of the dots on the map, plus because it's not an immediate health risk from the perspective of the government, there's not much money going into the science. Uh, uh, uh. They run it as um, an outreach and, and they have funding for that. That's the important thing. They get the funding from the people, the concerned citizens. Ah. So if you are interested in how much radioactivity or cesium specifically, Fukushima derived cesium is in your backyard. Yeah. You pay, a m pay some amount of money to them. They send you the sampling kit. You collect well, the water. You send it to them. Yeah. And they analyze it. So I have been servicing the Hawaiian it's some It's almost samples. like a DNA thing where you send away for a DNA or you send away for, you know, how your neighborhood is doing in yes. terms of cesium-134. Yes. <laughs> yes, so this is called the citizen science. It's, yeah. it's really funded by concerned citizens. Okay, so after, after the cesium heads north and into the gyre there, which is, what, thousands of miles away from yes. Hawaii, a long way, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to distribute, disseminate itself all over the world, just the way Bikini Island did back, back in the 50s and the early 60s. Um, and at that point, do, do we care? I mean, how much do we care? I, I mean, if it was coming directly at us and we were getting it, say, on Waikiki Beach, and the newspaper was saying, cesium levels elevated on Waikiki Beach, right? Then that would be a concern to our economy, right? That would be a concern to our economy. These headlines appeared last year in California. That's that when right? the plume arrived. Ooh. And uh, the levels were below of health concern. But that didn't stop the newspapers. That did not stop the newspapers <laughs> nor the scientists, because yes. now we want to understand, OK, what are the levels, how it mixes, how it disperses, yeah. how much of that goes to the fish. Yeah, yeah that and you eat. Yes. Right, and gets and into the water system somehow. Yeah. Yes, so, so definitely the scientists are following up. Even though the activities are low, we still want to know how much and Oh, right. fish. Fish. We have a chart on fish. It yes. just so happens we have a chart on fish. Keskese kasa. That's Hungarian. <laughs> what is so it? this is a study done by a student uh, that worked with me for two years, Hannah Azuz. She was an undergraduate at the Geology and Geophysics Department. 
Um, she came up to me with an interest. Okay, so I know you work with Fukushima derived radionuclides. I would like to study fish. And since there was no background information on which fish would concentrate cesium the most, we agreed that she just purchased all the kinds of different kinds of fish you can buy oh, in great Hawaii. Very scientific. Yes. <laughs> and so she analyzed these three different kinds of fish that she purchased in the store and looked at how much of the old, the, the nuclear weapons derived cesium there is in the fish and how much of the new cesium that came from Fukushima mm -hmm. there is in the fish. Oh, so you the, can tell. Yes, we can tell. So the, the blue is the old nuclear weapons derived. Okay, that's nuclear bikini, weapons, bikini. Chernobyl, okay. and other sources. Yeah. And the red is the new Fukushima derived cesium-137. That's the 30-year half-life. That's the one that will linger on for a long time. And the green is cesium-134, the two-year half-life. Yeah definitely coming from Fukushima. You see that some of the fish have none of the new one, none of the Fukushima derived, yeah. but, but about 30% of them do. And uh, for three of them, half of the cesium inventory in the fish is actually the Fukushima derived. And I would like to point out that the scale goes to 0.7 becquerels per kilogram. So becquerel, as I said, is the unit for radioactivity. The, the Food and Drug Administration sets a limit on how much cesium there could be in a fish so that they would not let you eat it anymore, and that's yeah. about a thousand becquerels per kilogram. Yeah. So this was 0.7 thousand is the limit. Well, we don't have the chart anymore, but I have uh, imprinted on my mind two fish that didn't seem to have any uh, 134 or 137, and that was cod. Cod is safe, at least according to the chart. Uh, and yellowfin tuna is safe, too. How do you like that? So I would say all these fish are safe if we really uh, compare it to the FDA limit. Yeah, okay. All because right. they right. have 0.7 becquerels per kilogram as opposed to the 1,000, which is the limit. Yes, some people argue that any radioactivity is bad for you, but then let me compare eating this fish to a banana. Eating this fish year-round, the, even the one that had the highest Fukushima-derived radioactivity, eating that fish year-round, assuming you eat about 24 kilograms of it, which is an average US, US consumption uh, per person, you would get from eating the same fish all year, the same dose as eating one banana. <gasps> Just Wait one till banana. Wait I tell my wife about this. She, <laughs> she made, she's loaded with bananas. <laughs> and I eat bananas too, but they have the naturally occurring potassium-40. These fish also have the naturally occurring potassium-40, which is at the levels of 50 yeah. compared to the 0.7 yeah. of cesium. But I, and I'm starting to get the idea that your science is, uh, in terms of its, you know, it, uh, in terms of its interest to the public, okay, is largely around how this kind of distribution of radioactive material which you're tracking um, affects our food and our lives. Uh, am I right or is there something else? The, it's both. I'm, sci I'm curious scientifically how the currents, the, uh, how, how radionuclides disperse in the ocean, what can we learn about the circulation in the Pacific the way Ocean. It moves, yeah. But I guess that's not so interesting for all the for the people that want to hear about, okay, but how bad it is, right? right. So that's why I'm, I, I, I offer to show this yeah. picture about the fish, because that's what I know yeah. people yeah. would care. Yeah, but I mean, we, I, we should also care about learning everything we can about the of Pacific course. Ocean. Of course. And seeing the way it moves, because there'll be, you know, I, I don't wish it, but maybe other For things future. that we want to track yes. aside from this. Yes. But, uh, you know, I, I can see people would be interested in this, not just because there's 134 or 137, but because there are other antigens out there uh, that may f find their way into our lives, our society, our food, our, our community, uh, and we won't realize it unless somebody is tracking it. So. And I would like to point out that, as a scientist, I see my role in producing these results and put them out there. I don't, I don't judge, I'm not saying Fukushima is not bad or bad. I'm just putting it out there and I set the FDA limit as, as how, what to compare to. So that's, that's my role, just to produce the results. And I let someone else decide, okay, safe or not safe. And in this case, the DOH, the Department of Health, uh, says the, the limits. As fair as fair. I mean, and, and, and you produce the data. And, and someone and, else decides. And someone else decides exactly, you know, what the medical effects are. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting having this discussion with you, Henrietta. This is really, really important and interesting. So glad you're doing this. 
You went to school in, uh, in, in Prague for your uh, original degree in what, ge ge geology was it? No, that one was nuclear. Uh, nuclear, nuclear? Engineering. Nuclear engineering and then at, at University of Florida in Tallahassee to your PhD in? Florida State University at, in PhD in chemical oceanography. And then God, in his ultimate wisdom, came down and made you come to Hawaii. Well, I had a stopover at the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Oh, Institution. okay. Well, that's why you're defending that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very But then, then I, yes, I uh, fortunately ended up here, where I enjoy the environment, but not just that. There is so much to study and learn. Yes, so. yes. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you for you doing for your work. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming down to Think Tech. Thank you. Thank you very much.